I like to come up here and hear announcements, but announcements are just an extension of worship, okay, guys? So it's just like the testimony. But I don't want our heart of worship to be lost in announcements, but that Holy Spirit is still here and in the midst of it all because it's an extension of worship, right? So instead of flowing in prophetically after the message, we're gonna flow in prophetically right now. I know the Lord's given me a gift in the prophetic, and I like to prophetically preach. So like I'm here, and I'm here to bring like the word of the Lord right now, you know? There's the word of the Lord tomorrow, there's the word of the Lord yesterday, and there's the word of the Lord right now. And this week, man, I have been, it's probably been a few weeks now, I've been ruined by the presence of God. We live in a politically charged atmosphere And as much as we live in a politically charged atmosphere, we live in a spiritually charged atmosphere. (laughs) And and we're in a time and a place um, where heaven's meeting earth. I, I remember as a youth going to youth meetings and worship gatherings, and we were praying for the harvest. And we were contending for the billions of souls. And I'm telling you, church, the billion souls are here now. And, and I just want you to tap into, Holy Spirit, what are you saying right now? What's the word of the Lord right now? Because he's not wanting you to tarry longer. He doesn't want you to sit idle. He's not asking for you to wait. He's saying, I'm here. And we saw a moment of worship this morning where heaven touched earth. Would you not agree with me? Like, come on. (laughs) I turned over to Sean. I was like, that was stupid good. Oh my gosh. (laughs) That was stupid good. The Holy Spirit is here. And my biggest fear as a minister is to miss the heart of the Father in the moment. Is it ringing a little bit? Okay. Um. I've always had a fear as a minister of missing the heartbeat in the room. And it's really hard to miss right now. (laughs) Holy Spirit is here. And I'm going to ask you um, to get in a position to receive. We're going to move prophetically a little bit right now. Um, I've felt for weeks now this exchange that the Lord is wanting to give And there's been things that we've held on to. And specifically, my thing this week was stress. And I've had just crazy amounts of stress, so much so that I woke up Tuesday morning and I couldn't move my neck. And we carry a stress and a burden and a weight that we're not called to carry. We carry hurt and trauma from the past that we are not really called to carry. And I woke up Tuesday morning and I read this prophetic word from a minister in the area, actually, which is really cool because he's in California, Sacramento area. So it's really like the Lord is living in this moment and there's a fresh rhema word here. And I'm gonna read this and I just want you to be in a place to receive. Whether you close your eyes, whether you open your hands, whatever it looks like, there's a gift to be given to us right now. There's an exchange that's gonna take place. Uh, Nate Johnston shares this word. In the next three months, there are coming significant encounters that will bring closure to the burnout and release a fresh burning. Many will have face-to-face moments with Jesus that will loose every burden and debris from the battle, cut the cords of unshakable hardship and ignite a fresh cry and a Macedonian call to places and assignments not previously on the radar. There will be dreams that untangle you, heal you, and impart to you. There will be visitations in the night that rekindle lost love and clear you of every other affection and desire. You will feel like you can breathe again, dream again, and laugh again. The wounds you endured in the past will close up and you will no longer live defined by who cursed you, usurped you, or warred against you. 
you will get up, pick up your bed, and walk into a new day without even one arrow in your side or roadblock at your feet. You will feel like you stepped out of the fiery furnace and were given a burning torch for the nations and a longing to see the harvest that you were created for. Where you were in survival mode, unable to pierce through the veil, you will feel victory in your spirit and a fresh shout to take the land. Joy will be so deep like a fresh well springing up inside you and you'll be led forth in wonder. The road behind you will begin to feel like an old story or an old song you used to sing but no longer do. And you will be consumed by the new anthem of heaven and the fresh wind in your sails right now. It may look like seeds are falling to the ground and dying an old way and seasons are drawing to an end. But as you lay down your backpack at his feet, you will pick up the new So lay down your unfulfilled promises and unfinished business. Lay down the mess and what you've tried to reconcile and simply surrender to the new chapter. Jesus. (laughs) Holy Spirit. We surrender to the new chapter, God. We don't want to miss this moment, but God, you've made it ever so profound that heaven is here to touch earth right now, Father. And I ask for wisdom to see what you have for us to see in this moment, that it would be a fresh word of God, that as we lay down our backpack and surrender to the new season, God, would you come and rekindle that love? We lay it at your feet, Father. We lay down the woes and the stress and the anxiety and the trauma and the hurt and our history. And we thank you that you're creating a new way, that this is a new season. I thank you that the harvest is at our doorstep, Father. Yeah, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. I'm so excited to be here today, guys. We, um, my daughter, if you don't know, um, her name's Harmony. We travel for softball. She's, she's a little stud. <laughs> she's um, 12 years old only, almost 13. And um, she's a catcher for her team, a softball team. And she plays third base as well. And um, due to COVID, we have been traveling a ton this last year. (laughs) And we've been to Utah and Oregon and Idaho. And um, just last weekend, we were in Arizona. And 13 hours in a car ride, because we didn't fly, can elicit two responses from a mom. (laughs) Come on. All you moms are like, 13 hours in a car with your 13-year-old daughter. And then there's grandparent moms who are like, oh, that's so wonderful. (laughs) You get to spend 13 hours in the car with your (laughs) 13-year-old. And I'm telling you, Harmony and I have, in our mother-daughter relationship, have butted heads very, very many times. Um, But God's used this last year of travel as a redemption in our relationship. And our car rides have been, they've been fun. A a year and a half ago, if you would ask me if I would have sat in the car with Harmony for 13 hours and had fun with her, I would have been like, you're crazy. (laughs) It wouldn't be so fun. But we've had this, these moments where there's just God has come and redeemed this time and we've grown super, super close. And in conversation, because we have a lot of valuable conversation, we have a lot of moments that are real deep, right? She asked me about community this one time. And she's like, mom, I'm on a softball team, obviously. There's 13 other girls on the team. What does a good friend look like? And I'm like, okay, Harm, come at me with those questions, right? (laughs) What does community look like? And I shared with her this picture. If you want to put the picture up. This is a group 
of friends in La Plata, Argentina, who hadn't seen their friend Gabriela in two months due to the hospital visitor restrictions due to COVID-19. You see Gabriela in that far left window is in a room. She was diagnosed with cancer and had been undergoing cancer treatment and isolation for two months. Gabriela's friends, as good friends look like, rented a crane to visit her from outside her window in the Fleming Hospital in La Plata. One friend yelled, they can't stop us. Another friend yelled, we knew we would see you while waving signs of love and honor. You see, sometimes in conversation, I can't necessarily, I don't have the right words to say to Harmony, but I can show her. And maybe her response was, her response was interesting to me, but but not surprising because her response was, mom, we have that. And I was like, you're right. But how did we get there, Harm? How did we get there? Let's take a look at something um, before I go on. If you want to put up the quote from goodtherapy.org, goodtherapy.org describes isolation. Gabriella was in isolation for two months before her friend rented that crane. Isolation is described as the experience of being separated from others. Isolation may result from being physically separated from others, such as when a person lives in a remote area. Isolation can result from being emotionally removed from a community. An isolated person may experience loneliness or low self-esteem. Over time, a person may develop social anxiety, depression, or other mental health concerns. If you want to put that same picture up, see, oftentimes a disease such as cancer can put us in isolation, much like Gabriella. But our own sin is a disease that can put us in isolation, making moments like this and these group of friends uncommon. But the reality is the church, the bride of Christ, that this should be the common response of the bride. This should be the common response of community. Why? Because we, you and I, we're created for connection. Gabriella wasn't meant to live in isolation in that room. She needed connection. You and I were created for connection. The response of community around us when disease and isolation are at our front door are because we were created for connection. As a church community, we've been in a series called Deleting Destiny. And today I'm going to share about the disease that comes to rob us of our destiny. We're going to turn to 2 Kings. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn to 2 Kings 5, 1 through 14. And before we hit the scripture, I'm just going to bring us into a place of what's happening in this story. We're going to read about a Naaman. And Naaman, when, if you've ever heard in the Bible before, which I'm sure many of you have had, the story of Naaman is about a, a man who was healed of leprosy. And when you look through scripture and if you read or you search Google or whatever that may be, the story of Naaman is literally the man who was healed from leprosy, the commander who was healed from leprosy, the man who was, who was healed, the man healed miraculously. And um, we're going to read about how he was healed, he healed, but after he was heard from a servant in his home in 2 Kings, he went to go to Israel. He went to go ask the king in Israel, to, and he decided to take a trip to see his healing. And so let's read. Let's read together. Um, 2 Kings 5 verse 1. Verse one says, now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. Before we go on, I wanna give you some historical context here. So Naaman was the commander of the army of Aram. The, uh, the, what had taken place, historical context here, is that 
Aram, uh, Aram was at war with Israel. Okay, so Aram's at war of Israel, and we read here that the commander of the, of, of the army of the king of Aram was named Naaman. Okay, so Naaman was, they've been in this war here. This is what's taking place. And Aram has now won in a war against Israel. So we're seeing right here that Naaman, of the, Naaman was the commander of the army and he won, right? Victory, because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. So I want you to see here, step into this place of this man named Naaman has just won and he's led a huge army in a victory in a war against Israel. This man, Naaman, had everything good. He had everything going for him. He was highly regarded. He was successful. He had a great reputation. He had status, but that stuff didn't matter. You see, Naaman was diagnosed with leprosy. And leprosy, this disease, came and it dismantled everything that was going good for Naaman. Naaman had this disease. And let me tell you, this disease back then was, was a skin disease, right? It caused nerve issues. It caused damage. But it completely isolated Naaman. So even though he was held in high regard, he was this great commander and he had just led a, a battle and he was victorious in battle, this man had a skin condition that made him isolated. In the culture, there was actually no ability to heal leprosy and this man eventually would die in isolation. This man was set up with, with, oh my gosh, all the greatest things, right? He had everything that he had ever wanted. He had so much good going for him, but he had leprosy. So you may be thinking, like, how does his disease, leprosy, actually relate to me? I don't have leprosy, but I'd ask you to hear me on this. We can relate to Naaman because you and I actually have a terminal disease called sin, and sin will strip us of the vulnerability that we may need to be within community. You see, Naaman, he had a sin condition. Naaman, I'm sorry, we have a sin condition. Naaman had a skin condition. Both of these dynamics, our sin condition and Naaman's skin condition, created these antisocial social situations that aren't good for any of us because we were created for connection. Yeah. Let's move on. Verse two. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. Verse three. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. I want to stop there, but we're going to go on. I'm going to come back. Verse four, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter of, to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Okay, so let me paint a picture of what's going on, right? So Naaman has left his home and he is going to see the king of Israel. There's going to be some tension, would you agree? There's some tension here because... Aram has just won in a war against Israel, right? And now he's going to the king of Israel and he's buying his healing. He's bringing 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 sets of clothing. Naaman, maybe he wants his healing, but the only way he's showing he wants his healing is he's gonna buy his healing. Why? Because 
there's tension there. He's just beat the king of Israel at war. Let's look at the king of Israel's response. This cracks me up. Verse seven, as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? I mean, he tore his robes. This is a little dramatic, right? But (laughs) warranted, he's like, are you kidding me? You want to be healed from your leprosy? You just came and you killed my people. We were at war and you're coming and you want to buy this healing? You want to buy, you want to come see my prophet? You want to come to my land? You want to come buy this healing? Verse eight, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Verse nine, So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Let's stop here. So now this great commander, right? He's like, come. He's brought all this stuff to come by his healing. And he shows up at the prophet's house to be healed and the prophet won't even come out. Good gosh, he's like, am I really awesome? I mean, do I really have anything going for me? I don't really have anything going for me. The prophet won't even come out and speak to me. Instead, he sends his servant and he says, go tell him to wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. Verse 11, but Naaman went away angry and said, he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Come on, there should be a show right now. Like, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in rage. So what's happening here is Naaman is like, I have way better rivers to go wash in. I have way cooler area. Uh, I mean, I can look way better. If I'm going to go wash myself seven times in a river, I'm not going to go do it in that dirty river. Dang. And he goes off in rage. He's angry. He's come all the way to see this prophet. The prophet won't even come to see him. And now he's told him to go wash seven times in this dirty river. Let's go on. Verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more than when he tells you wash and be cleansed? So so he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Let's take a look at this process and how completely humiliating it had to be for Naaman. First, the prophet won't even come out and talk to him. And then... It's his servants. It's his servants that challenge him to say, go. If, if, he told you, if he told you to go jump off a bridge and dunk seven times, wouldn't you do it? Go do it. He's telling you to do it. He had to give himself to the counsel of the people that he thought were even lower than him. And then the prophet tells him to dip seven times. I mean, come on, let's, let's picture this. He goes into the river and he stands there and he dunks one time. And he's like, mm, nothing's happening here. Am I going to keep doing this? And then he does it again. And then he does it again. Like how silly did he probably look? See, pride makes us artificial, but humility makes us real. Pride makes us artificial, artificial, but humility makes us real. Naaman had to humble himself. 
And he had to humble himself in front of whom he thought lesser than him. But let me tell you something. The Lord used his community to see him healed. There's something about vulnerability and humility in community that the Lord will use in that moment to see you healed. See, we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be humble. We want, we want to keep the disease. We want the sin to be here. We want to keep it close to the chest. But it's in the vulnerability and humility in the community that Naaman was in that saw him healed. And we're talking about a fatal condition, right? He was going to die alone and in isolation. I'm going to ask um, Jason to come up here. We're going to go back to verse 2. And I want to introduce you to the hero of Naaman's story. Verse 2 reads, Now bands of raiders from, raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. What's happening here? We're talking about a, a girl whom during war was just stolen from her home, right? It, it, the, the scripture reads, now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl, right? So this girl is stolen from her home. This girl has been kidnapped, placed in the commander's home and, and supposed to serve the commander's wife, right? Are you guys tracking with me here? She's taken to a new place and forced to be a servant girl to the commander's wife. At best, this girl had been stripped from her family and separated, but at worst, her family had been trampled on and she is the only surviving member of her family. And she's in this house. Think about this, guys. If this was you or I, and we had been kidnapped from our family and taken to a house a house where the man, your master, had leprosy, would, is it just me or would I be sitting back saying, man, I can't wait for this man's arms to fall off. <laughs> like, what am I doing here? <laughs> Instead, the girl says, if only my master would go and see the prophet, I know he would be healed. Think about this. The only way Naaman got healed was because of this little girl. And she exhibited a forgiveness that is unmatched. Nothing like you and I would ever see. See, forgiveness always requires a suffering servant. Forgiveness always requires a suffering servant. Forgiveness always requires someone to pay the cost. This little girl in this moment, for whatever reason, is in this moment exhibits the, exhibits the type of forgiveness that Jesus Christ gives himself. Let me share with you something. Community recognizes we all have a sin condition. Community recognizes that pride makes us artificial, but humility makes us real, and that forgiveness comes at a cost. Naaman's healing came by way of community. We often read the miracle stories of healing in the Bible, and they feel so far off, really, really unrelatable or unreachable, but God comes in stories and He uses community so that stories become personable and intimate. And he uses stories of a man with a disease whom was placed in connection with a group of servants that challenged him and a little girl that carried the forgiveness of Jesus Christ so that you and I would understand that connection is the prescription for our transformation. Connection is the prescription for our transformation. 
And as they look at the story of Naaman, God doesn't hide himself to tease us. And he doesn't give his heart in pieces. We were created for connection. Vulnerability at its finest brings humility so that we could be connected to those around us. And even times where we think that we're opening up to somebody who may be lesser than us or somebody whom we really don't want to open up to or be vulnerable with. He comes. God comes and he challenges. And it's in that humility that he comes in a moment to connect with you or I that he wouldn't hide himself, that it wouldn't be far off, that it wouldn't be some untouchable or untangible thing, but that God would come to connect. And often we wanna push away. We wanna turn away in rage just like Naaman did. And we wanna say like, I'm done. There's been too much hurt. There's been too much trauma. I've got leprosy. Nobody wants me. But instead, God wants to come just like the image that I shared earlier. And He wants to be the friends that rent a crane to come to your window when you've been isolated for two months. And He wants to come and He wants to destroy isolation in its face. If anything, the last year has taught us isolation isn't a place for connection. And where God wants us to be when heaven meets earth is in connection, in vulnerability and in humility with each other. And today I feel the invitation for an exchange. That as you lay down your backpack of hurt, broken trust, and unrealistic expectations in community that you would see the vulnerability of those that God has given you. Yeah, if you could stand. Yeah. Thank you, Father, that you don't give your heart in pieces that you don't hide yourself to tease us. Right now, I wanna come against the feelings of loneliness, a feeling of isolation, a feeling that you're alone and that you don't have community. Like, Ravon, what is this community that you're talking about? I don't have community. And I wanna come against that right now in the name of Jesus. And I ask, Lord, right now that you would put people in our place, in our moment right now, that we were created for connection. So I thank you, Lord, that you are making way for connection. But that connection comes when we break down those walls of pride. Thank you, Jesus, that we were created for connection. We were created for connection with you and that you're not far off, that you're not this um, far God in the universe that looks at me with anger, looks at me uh, disappointed in the choices that I've made, but that, Father, you come. Ever so near, ever so gently, that you come in connection, that you come not hidden, that you come fully here, fully alive, fully invested into what we do and what we have our what we have in our path, Father. So I thank you for the destin, destiny of connection, Father. And I speak right now that you would come, that you would feel ever so near. Yeah, you're so good, God. May you come and wreck us, Father, for connection. May we come moved by you. May we come wanting 
to see the disease gone, doing whatever it takes to see connection, Father. I thank you that as Naaman, when he walked away angry, it was at that moment that you met him and you said, "Uh uh-uh, like I'm here, I wanna heal you, that you came and you humbled him, Father, that he had the, he was in the right place at the right time, that humility would come, enter his heart, and he would do what looked foolish, God. I thank you, Lord, that you come and you wreck us for the things that might look foolish, Father, that you come and heal instead. So, Father, we thank you for connection, God. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you that as we lay our backpack down, we thank you for the exchange that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.